Hello everybody, welcome to Granville Guitars here in lovely St. Petersburg, Florida. We're here today with our good friend Walker Keck, the one and the only Walker Keck, <laughs> a man with many stories to tell and great answers to provocative questions we hope today. So here we are with this edition of 20 Questions with Scooter. Let's start off with question number one. Discuss your earliest musical memories. Uh, good morning. Uh, I would have to say, as soon as I became aware, there was always music in my family. There was always, every house had a piano and an upright bass in it. Sweet. Now, where, where was this? Hawaii. I was Hawaii. born in Hawaii. Right. My father was a Hawaiian musician who had gained some acclaim with a, a band called The, um, the Invitations during the 60s. And he was a lifelong musician, always played in bars, good to go to the bars, so I've been studying bars for most of my life. Wow. Isn't and his mother also was a recording artist and recorded well into her 80s, my uh, grandmother. Wow. Irma Chilton Keck. I have to Google that. <laughs> That's interesting. All right, uh, num question number two. Who or what compelled you to pick up a guitar? Well, the first electric guitar I heard was Dwayne Eddy in a, an album called Rebel Rouser. And I was, it was like a whole orchestra in his hands. Uh, there was no uh, singing per se. And so I just heard this wonderful, wonderful music. The first album that I was really turned on to, I uh, was probably eight or nine, was Hank Garland with a record called Velvet Guitar. I just, I still own the record. It's flat. Almost groove free. <laughs> Wore that sucker out. Uh, who was and continues to be your main guitar influence? I would say Mike Bloomfield. Early Mike Bloomfield. Uh, he came at a time, it was just at a crack of our culture. And his playing, although steeped in blues, some tone or some musical thing, the scales he used and his use of microtonal bends uh, is still with me to this day. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, have you ever been influenced by non-guitar music or players? Definitely, definitely. Um, growing up in the 60s we were exposed to everything. Indian music, sitar, uh, Hispanic music, South American music, Central American music, Hawaiian music, it was Japanese music. We had records of the Dancers of Bali, which are those little string things. It's always music in the house. And so it all, especially the sitar and drums. I love the drums. I'm a frustrated drummer, but I just couldn't practice the drums as a kid. Yeah. yeah. I'm, a, I'm a big fan fan of drumming and drummers. It's essential to rock. Oh yeah. No good there are no great bands without a great drummer. Exactly right. There just aren't. Not that I can think of off the top of my head. Um let's see here. Uh question five. Describe the local music scene where you came up. Nineteen sixty six Hate Ashbury. Oh, wow. Um, not to get too deep. No, get deep. Okay. Uh, when I was 14, 15, I was in the ninth grade, and I had gone to live with my father in L.A. It was a very interesting time, very tragic time. And at the end of that year, under a lot of pressure, he threw me to the street. I was 15. He told me to leave with a member of the party. He, was, it, he had a lot of issues, okay? So... I was glad to get out of the house. The person he sent me with was named Neville Savage. Mm -hmm. And this is a guy from Britain who was a family friend who played guitar and who happened to live in Haight-Ashbury, San Francisco. That night we drove from my father's house where I just left whatever I took with me. That's all I, I had. I didn't know about Haight-Ashbury. Um, we got to his place on Waller Street, and he said, Look, your dad's an asshole. Um, you can stay here as long as you need. I can't feed you. You're going to have to take out the garbage. You do some chores. And I did that for a summer. The second night, he took me to the Avalon Ballroom, where I saw Bo Diddley, 
Quicksilver Messenger service and receive the Grateful Dead or another iconic band. And I walked in there and from being thrown out by my dad, I felt accepted by a new community. And everybody was so good. This is before people started burning each other and and um, hurting each other. Um, this is a time when they had a store called the, um, I forget what it was called, the, the canned food store or the, the trust store. You go in and you take a can of soup if you're hungry. And when you get on your feet, you bring back two cans of soup. And that's how it worked. Later, it was just, you know, when everybody came to Head Ashbury, it, was, it, it didn't work anymore because it was all taking, not giving back. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And everywhere you went, somebody had a guitar. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is, at that time, um, guitar was changing. And really, the pickers were either the surf guys, who were the, you know, the shredders of the time, and then there was the folkies, who were turning into the Grateful Dead and the Quicksilver guys who had played acoustic guitar a long time, started playing electric guitar for the first time uh, through Fender amps, uh, Gibson guitars and Fender amps. And uh, it was... It was a wonderful time to be alive and to see it all. Well, feel free to elaborate if you want to, because, it, you know, I was born in 64, so I missed out on all of that cultural revolution. I didn't start really listening to records till on into the 70s. So it's one thing to read about this stuff in a book, and it's another thing for someone like yourself to sort of color it, you know, okay. really fill it in. So It was a wonderful time. I would have stayed on the street and never gone back to school, but I had this thing in my head that if you didn't have an education, you were going to be very, very poor. Um, it was great because I floated on the culture, the subculture that time. Um, it was the hippies and the squares. You know, uh, they would have tour buses come through and people would poke at us and they'd come from Michigan or wherever. To, Look at the hippies! You know, the flower children. We were the flower children, so it was very much us and them. And this is before all the drug burns and the heroin came in and the speed. Uh, we were at one with the Hells Angels. Everybody was cool. You were groovy. Uh, nobody looked at somebody like... You don't fit in here. You know, it was very widely accepted. People would loan me guitars. People would try to teach me stuff. And I was, I was struggling with my, myself at the time, but absorbing, absorbing, absorbing. And uh, it was a great time to be alive. And I, I, I wish we'd all gone through it too as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it was really neat. <laughs> Uh, you know, I have fond memories of my coming up, too. Everyone does, mm -hmm. I think. But it just sounds like that was a time and a place out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see here. Discuss some highlights of your playing career. Mm. It's all been a highlight. Um, even bummer gigs. Would, when you study it in time later, it was a learning experience. Um... I think one big highlight, I've looked at this question and I had to really think about it, was hearing my own voice and my own music on vinyl uh, to put out our own record. And the first time you hear it, it's like, God, this sounds nothing like the tapes. It's so warm and wonderful. Um, another highlight was the night my son was born, January 15th of 1982. Uh, we had our record release party. And um, it was a very tough birth. And my son had... Uh, Severe cardiac issues, but I still did the gig. Uh, the medical people thought, oh, this guy doesn't care, but I cared very much. That night was a magic performance. Some of it's on tape, uh, but that was, um, that was the big whoopee for me. It was the birth of my son, Alexander. Wow, thanks for that. That's awesome. Uh, let's see. Are you proficient on any other non Stringed instruments. Uh, not proficient. I started to play hand drum, like Indian hand drum, mm -hmm. studying ancient beats. But maybe I'm a wimp, but hitting the drum would make me have these little tiny ganglions in my joints and my hands. And that worried me. And my hands started to kind of get like a claw. And I thought that's not good for um, guitar playing at uh, this stage of the game for me. No, probably not. Uh... 
Talk about a turning point in your career. Every time I've taken lessons. <laughs> I'm one of those guys that was like, I listen to my friends and they say, you, you have the talent, it's within you, you know, don't, don't contaminate it with this and that and the other thing. And, I mean, I'd had music in school and they were pretty square. But when I learned how to really sing from Claudine Spint in Berkeley, California, it changed everything. I, my uncle Kirby, who you'll hear me talk about very much, was critical in my musical career, um, turned me on to the best guitar player. I've had several guitar teachers, excuse me. Uh, this guy's name was Tim Landis, and he was way beyond me. A uh, California player who... I wanted to be heavy metal, you know, over the top, you know, that kind of thing. And he said, well, you need to learn the basics. And he is the blackest white man I've ever met. Total unique person, Curtis Mayfield, all that soul stuff to get my right hand loosened up. The, the, the funky, you know, the picking and all that was uh, Tim Landis. I took from him for years and just a wonderful, wonderful player, person, teacher. Question number nine. Number nine? Number nine. Discuss your current gig. Okay, current gig. And this is the best part, folks. I'm an old fart. <laughs> and I've gotten to the point where I can say yes or no whenever I want. Uh, recently, I played, it's at the beach. You know, if you want to if you wanna make money, and I don't like to haul around my stuff unless I get some cash. Uh, and that's what you get paid for is hauling this stuff around. The playing's free. Um, I play the beach. Uh, I play private parties. And from these parties come gigs. Uh, as you know, I like to record at home. I have a Pro Tools set up and I just really enjoy that. But I also enjoy the thing of being able to say yes or no and feel good about it. Um, I love being in a band and a band is a very, very unique situation. It's like a family and you have to get along. I know I've been in many bands where the leader says, this is not a democracy, it's a communist, and I am Stalin. And that's cool if he's got direction. If it doesn't happen, people will drop off. Um, like I said, a band is the most wonderful thing and it's the most elusive thing <laughs> that I've ever come across. So now I play by myself. I have very high quality friends. When they have time, we get together and play. Sometimes there are gigs. So that is my gig, is enjoying my music to the utmost. Boy, that's about the best answer I can imagine to that question. <laughs> Maybe I should just eliminate the question. I, <laughs> I think you've set the gold standard for that. Uh, question 10, where and how often do you perform? Um, you know, it's catch as catch can. Sometimes I'm very busy. I perform mostly in my little studio, Black Snake Studios at the beach, which is a great place to record. <laughs> um, I have played all along the beach, up and down, any place where they serve alcohol, they pay musicians to play. Um, I'm not a big uh, Jimmy Buffett fan, but that seems to be the fair. Uh, but you can always squeeze your own tunes in there. And there's lots of jams, and I know so many bands, and they say, bring your guitar and you can take up a jam. But, um, uh, so the gig is whatever I want it to be, and I like it that way. Nice. Uh, Eleven, uh, any non-musical ventures that you'd like to discuss? Oh. Uh, Things that are important to you that you do. Well, I guess recording is, um, um, it, for us that have these studios at home now or used to have to pay to go into a big studio, it's a wonderful time. But also, there's not, you don't have the direction, it's just you in the box. Right. So if you come into it with some kind of idea, then that is, that is what works best. Um, Non-musical, uh... Gee, you know, just living, just getting along in life. Um, a lot of people in our business are um, have found comfort in artificial stimulants and things like that. So you have to kind of watch people um, for that, probably in all parts of life. But um, uh, 
as far as non-musical, to get back to the original question, just living your life and uh, trying to do the right thing. Question 12. Discuss your practice regimen. Okay, I'm an old fart, and <laughs> so I have to warm up my whole body. I used to be able to wake up, pick up the guitar, and just start wailing right away, and wail all day, and wail all night. Now, I there's a certain, I do my scales, and also I warm up my voice. I find that uh, good vo voice care, uh, keeping nodes off your voice, trying to stay out of smoky situations, uh, things like that are a, um, uh, a constant reminder of if you want to do this a long time, you have to take it easy. I know so many people that have developed carpal tunnel and stuff like that. Uh, you know, things with our hands, um, dupatrins, contractures, and things that I don't want to get into. Um, and especially the voice. The best singers still get nodes on their chords. So by easing into it, with electric guitar and lighter strings, and then by the evening, uh, acoustic guitars and heavier strings and more a different picking regimen, a different singing regimen, uh, that, that that works for me best. Okay. Um, do you work a regular job? Scooter, I worked 30 years as a surgical nurse. I worked as a surgical nurse because I didn't have to work weekends. <laughs> you had to take call every fifth and sixth weekend you know, to go in. But I could have long hair because you had to, you know, put it in a hat, mask all day, little cold room, and you do the same things. It was a fabulous career. I loved my nursing career. The best thing I loved about it was being a teacher after I had gotten into it and people come in and they're so fearful. Surgery, blood, guts, death, dismemberment. And, um, to see them change, uh, it was a real good thing. But I kept my nursing license because I didn't like to starve as a musician. The thing is, I knew people who were, who were touring the world. They were in bands, big bands of people I could name that you would go, wow. And they all lived at home with their moms. They had their old room. They were in their 20s and 30s. And yes, they were very famous. And you saw their records, you know, with their pictures on it and stuff, but they were living at home, and I didn't have that option. I realized what poverty was early, and I saw a lot of poor musicians, just pathetic, great talent, wasted from alcohol, drugs, or just insanity, and I didn't want to do that. So this was a very stabilized job, uh, as long as you showed up. Everything was groovy. I met the most wonderful people I learned, the most wonderful lessons working in surgery. Um, I, I, it's hard to say whether I was a musician or whether I was a registered nurse because uh, one paid the bills and one fed my inner soul. So that's that. Where did you uh, study? Where did you go to college? Uh, California. I was born in Hawaii and uh, very young. Um, my father, who was a flaky musician, he was a great <laughs> musician and a great guy, but he had his issues. I'm glad he's my dad. He's gone now and, and that's that. But um, I, uh, my mom took me to California very early where we went from Honolulu to Watsonville, California which is a very agricultural kind of area that bred some wonderful musicians, including my uncle Kirby, who I will talk about if you ever meet me. He's the main influence. Um, and uh, uh, after that, we moved up uh, to Berkeley, where um, I, uh, I, I grew up, basically grew up in Berkeley, California. I'm sorry, was that the question? No, I was wanting to know where you studied nursing. Oh, nursing, yeah. yeah. Uh, California in um, the University of San Pablo. And uh, I had gone to school to be a drama major because I was going to be a star. <laughs> and uh, after two years of that, I saw the people who were acting and starving and living with their parents. And I said, you know, I need to get a piece of paper that I can travel around and make money and not have to wash dishes and wear a hairnet. And so I got into nursing. Nursing school was, I, 
talk about what am I doing here? This was 1972, 73, and men were not nurses. And so everybody said, hey, you long-haired hippie, you're, you're one of them funny boys, are you? And um, uh, I had to, as long as I knew I had my anatomy and what my true desires were, that stuff didn't bother me. And in fact, it kind of worked to my advantage in a way. But I won't talk about that. But yeah, it was uh, California. And I worked 30 years for Contra Costa County in Martinez, California. Best job a person could ever have. Wow. Cool. Um, let's see. At what point did you think you could make a living at music? Never. At no point. Um, we all get delusional. God, I want to be like so-and-so, Elvis or whatever. But if you look at the guys at the top, are they happy? I mean, can you, can you live that way? My friends, I've seen so much fame. I've seen people go from obscure to famous. It's a heavy load to carry. You forget who you are. You believe people who tell you you're the best thing on earth. And when it goes away, it's devastating. Um, Kevin Gilbert, in his opus, um, Shaming of the True. Shaming of the True. The last line is, don't forget who you are. And that's so easy to do in our business, you know. Anyway, that's my little thing. If there is a rock masterpiece, that is it. Yeah. Oh, definitely. It's flawless in nearly every way. Exactly. And darn it, our hero was flawed. And I see this so much in people who really, really rise to the top. There's some flaw that if they can cover it up or push it to the side, it's great. Um, it's very hard to find an integrated person, such as Joe Satriani, who can take the fame and work with it and build on it and keep it at bay. This is how people get into alcohol and heroin and all these crazy things that we know are terrible for us. But at that point, when there's no floor and you're looking for something to hold on to, faces come out of the rain mm -hmm. and you have to be very, very careful. Well said. Tell us about your favorite guitar. My favorite guitar is a gold top Les Paul my Uncle Kirby gave to me at my mom's funeral. You've worked on it. Oh, it is I love magical. the guitar. I have other guitars that I love very much, but that is a guitar that when they say, you got to leave that island, buddy, I will grab that guitar and leave. Yep. When it floods. That would be a good choice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm connected to it. Yeah. I swear it's like my age, and I it's like... I don't know how, I, I know how it got to me. I can't explain the process, but this guitar and I, I don't play it a lot, you know, because it's, it's fragile. Mm -hmm. It's 60 something years old. And I, I don't want you all to know where I live. <laughs> <laughs> I keep it in a vault <laughs> in St. Louis. <laughs> but uh, uh, there are many wonderful, wonderful guitars made all over the world. It doesn't have to be a USA Gibson or Fender. But this is like, this guitar does it for me. Uh, I cannot pick up any guitar and not be inspired by it. There are very few junk guitars. Wayne Newton once told me, he was trying to tune an ovation guitar, and he goes, you know what? Sometimes guitars should have stayed trees. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. Um, 16. Talk a little about your current rig, uh, preferences in strings, picks, tuning, etc. Okay. I recently, every time I get some new strings, I, I just love them to death. I'm a Diodario guy. I think that's the industry standard I've done. They're, all of their stuff is really industry standard. You turn me on to snake oil strings. Mm -hmm. These are handmade strings that make a difference. I recently was turned on to scalar strings, mm -hmm. and when I put them on my guitar, it made all the difference in the world. I told you about it, and you said, well, maybe it's just something new that, that, is, uh, that you're feeling. I have, I bought four sets of strings. I'm saving the fourth pack for mm -hmm. 
some special guitar. Those three guitars get played all the time. I don't notice any difference in the strings. Those guitars sound much different than my other stringed instruments. Yeah. So I love scalar. There's a problem with supply, so right. you gotta jump on them. Right. They're uh, they're from the same company that makes the the snake oil strings. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Groovy. Yeah. See, you you've you've discovered that that uh, round core versus hex core. There you go. <laughs> um, also, picks. I could do many hours talking about picks. Picks are the hidden secret of our craft. And I was always, give me a heavy pick, a Fender 356, and I'll be happy with that. Well, when you start experimenting and using different things, uh, try using some older picks. Uh, I've been cleaning up my house. I found extreme stashes of picks that I bought. I am the pick guy. I bought picks that I have i would forgotten I bought, and they are so wonderful. I have one pick that, if it ever gets away, I would just lay down and die. Um, I have to tell you this, that <laughs> natural fiber picks are the best. Poor little turtles never had a chance, <laughs> but it's the best, it's the best thing that I've found. I don't have a bunch of them. I have a bunch of old ones, and they're just wonderful, and I would never kill a turtle to make a plectrum. And they don't do that anymore. No, of course. I haven't for a long time. You have now. to find an old turtle shell and be very quiet about it. Yeah. Poor turtles. <laughs> what what piece of gear, what one piece of gear is essential to your playing? This is the hardest question that I looked at. Honestly, cables and picks. Yeah. It's the weirdest thing. When I think back at all the trouble I've had in a live situation, in a recording situation, it comes down to picks. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, cables. Mm -hmm. I've brought you a wonderful amp. There's nothing wrong with it, but I had a bad cable and was making that amp-like noise. I brought it here. Scooter said, this amp's fine. This... And by the way, that amplifier was a Fender. Um, uh, da, 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 da. What is it? Blues Junior? No, the, the Blues Junior, the uh, Deluxe 410. Oh, that's the uh, Super? No. It's, basement. No, it's not the basement. It's called the. Uh, this is terrible. It's about getting old. <laughs> um, is it that Victoria? No, 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 no. It's 410. I went to go buy the basement speaker when they first came out, the reissue, but I got this one. And. Um, oh, uh, Blues DeVille. Blues DeVille, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and um, 410s, the. It, my main amp for everything for years and years. Now in my old age, I buy amps that appeal to me, and I love them. Sometimes I make mistakes when I buy amp pegs, but um, basically, uh, Marshall Fender. Um, my, my rig is I I don't have a go-to guitar. It's whatever I'm playing that day. Uh, they're all wonderful, and they have different applications, and they have different appeals at different times of the day. So I don't really have a rig per se, but I use coil cords exclusively. There's a magic there. There is. Uh, question 18. Describe your proudest moment as a musician. A uh, proudest moment? Um, so many. Yeah. I mean, you come off stage and it's like there's nothing that can compare with that, whether you played good or bad. And here's the thing, sometimes you play terrible and you go, God, I'm sucking, how can, why aren't they throwing stuff? And you get off stage and people say, that was the best I've ever heard. Well, maybe this is where you should talk about Oda. Uh, the Oda band, Randy yeah. Oda? Yeah. I grew up in El Cerrito and my neighbor was Randy Oda. He and his brother Kevin, uh, Kevin was a drummer, Randy was a year younger than I. He went to a different high school, but we were... We hung together, and he wrote a song that became very, very popular that Eddie Money did called I Think I'm In Love. And at that point was when my, what I perceived as my career was really, uh, we were playing big gigs. We had roadies. We didn't have to set up our own stuff. It would be there. We just had to show up, do the gig, walk home. Sometimes there was limos. Sometimes there was tours to L.A. It was a wonderful time. Um... Uh, and I, it was a bittersweet moment when I watched my buddy Eddie Money singing our song on Solid Gold. And it reached number two. And it was 
the most wonderful time. We had our own record out at the time with that same song on. We had a video on the brand new MTV at the time, and I was pretty confident that we'd be touring the world very soon. Take a bunch of young guys who are poor, living at home with their moms, or working little Joe jobs, and dump a whole bunch of money on them. It, um, if there's no guidance, it can be a bad thing. Um, it broke up the band. Uh, we all thought we were stars at that point. Never happened again. <laughs> but um, I got a really good idea of how music business, the oxymoron, really works. And when you rise to the top, what happens up there? And um, let's just say, at that time, a bunch of things happened. My son was born. I had been working for 10 years as a nurse, thinking I was going to get out of it any day. And now uh, it was like, I need to get serious about my family life. I was 30 years old, and my time of being a teenage idol had pretty much passed. So uh, there was that. Randy Yoda, great friend to this day. Um, Great player. He still has his own band, Opo, O-P-O, with members of that, his brother, and then our bass player from the Randy Oda band. And we're still, I stay at his house when I go out to California, and we're very good friends. He's a great guy. I would call that a pretty, pretty proud moment. Yeah. Yeah. Question 19. If given the chance, what non-musical profession would you be interested in? You know, this is... The best question. I've always wanted to work for the Swedish swim team. <laughs> I'd like to go around and be their roadie on the bus and on the airplanes, um, taking care of them, making sure they have comfortable place to sleep with their showers and their their makeup uh, issues. That's what I want to do. <laughs> I want to tour with the Swedish swim team. Please, I pray every <laughs> night for it. <laughs> That's a good one. All right, we're down to the last question. Question number 20. What artist who is legendary and important to most people do you just not get? Kiss. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I was first aware of them on Tuesday night at the Fillmore in San Francisco, uh, Fillmore West, uh, Holy Ballroom. They would have uh, new bands coming up, and we would see, I saw Bruce Springsteen there. I saw a um, bunch of up-and-coming bands, a lot of schlock, and one night Kiss came, and I thought, what the hell is this? <laughs> I didn't think they played very well. It was way loud, and uh, I thought, this is not for me. They went on to sell millions and millions and make billions of dollars more than I did, <laughs> and and I, I I I bought rock and roll over, and I listened to it, and I thought, this is okay if you're a kid. I had passed that already, um, so you know so many of the bands that came along, you know after S A T U R D A Y, and you go up to number one, and you go, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> the answer here is it's cyclical. It keeps changing, it keeps rolling, and if you keep on your little gig, then it will come to pass that you will have a time to shine in the sun. I am I am not degrading those guys at all. Uh, you can see what happened to fame with a couple of their members. Um, and even though you can be given millions and millions of dollars, it doesn't mean you can survive. Um, but um, I... I'm not picking on you, because I know you love KISS, and you've explained why, that they came along at a certain point in your life. Um, I can definitely see how one would dislike them. I, I it's not that I dislike them, <laughs> I totally, um, you know, and you see the whole thing happen, and you see them now at the end, and you go, geez, that doesn't look like you back then. <laughs> but it's what happens. It's what happens. I saw Ace Freely, you know, I used to get all the magazines with these Les Pauls. You would kill for any one of them. Mm -hmm. And he had everything at one point. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, things just happen, man, when you rise to this thing 
this level that you're not at, the non-reality of the music business. Maybe it's real. I don't know. I live in this world. They live in theirs. But that's what I want to say about that. I'm, you know, we going back and forth, you and I, about Jimi Hendrix. Jimi came at that perfect time. I was into blues and all this stuff. And, um, and he was just like modern blues. And, you know, those martial amplifiers and the whole thing that Chaz Chandler brought forward. It was great. I had gone to see Jimi and he sucked. I had left the concert thinking, I've been all wrong about this guy. He's just loaded hippie. And uh, other times he was off the charts. So it's one of those things, man. You know, if you could get it under control, great. Uh, I do not hate Kiss. I just didn't get them. Yeah. Along with many other people. Um, but I, uh, that's the one that came to mind for this interview. I'm glad you picked up on that in that question. It's not about what you hate. It's yeah. not. It's what you just flat don't get. I don't understand. I didn't understand <laughs> Iggy Breaky Heart. That well, went to number one, man. Oh, yeah. You know, Who Let the Dogs Out, uh, Macarena. I wish I would have written those songs, but I didn't. And those people are on a tropical island somewhere. <laughs> Well, that's all we got time for today. Walker. Thank you, Scooter, for being the person you are. Love you. I couldn't be doing what I'm doing without your expertise. Well, that's extremely nice of you to say so. I hope to someday earn that trust. <laughs> 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 Everyone, our good friend Walker Keck, that's all we got time for today. If you have any questions or want to know more about what we do here at Granville Guitars, seek us out on the web at GranvilleGuitars.com or on Facebook. Say bye, Walk. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.